<laughs> so, okay, I'll sing verse 1. That way y'all can get the gist. And then we'll sing verse 2 and 3 together, all right? Okay, so it goes like this. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Verse 2. Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gate threw open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Thou hast bled and died for me, I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Amen. All right, then. So we're going to sing Still Sweeter Every Day because let me tell you something. My Jesus gets sweeter and sweeter every day. All right, 484, please. 484. If some of you can do different parts like the bottom or tenor or bass whatever man feel free the more the merrier all right 484 in your red hymn book here we go to jesus every day i find my heart is closer drawn he's fairer than the glory of the golden purple dawn he's all my fancy pictures in its fairest dreams and more each day he grows the sweeter than he was the day before the hand cannot be fancied this side the golden shore oh the He'll be still sweeter than he ever was before. His glory broke upon me when I saw him from afar. He's fairer than the lily, brighter than the morning star. He fills and satisfies my longing spirit o'er and o'er. Each day he grows no sweeter than he was the day before. The hat cannot be fancied. This side, the golden shore. Oh, the He'll be still sweeter than he ever was before. My heart is sometimes heavy, but he comes with sweet relief. He folds me to his bosom when I droop with blight and grief. I love the Christ to all my burdens in his body bore. Each day he grows the sweeter than he was the baby before. The half cannot be fancied. This side, the golden shore. Oh, there he'll be still sweeter than he ever was before. Hey, Amen. Bless God. I'm glad he's that sweet to Woo! you. Sounds like it. All right. Please stand. Please stand with your red hymn books. And we're going to sing page 493, please. 493. Just turn a few more pages. And I can't tell you how happy I am because I'm saved, saved, and saved. <clears throat> All right, since the Savior found me. Here we go. Since the Savior found me, pardon all my sin. I have had the joy and living hope within. 
Gone is all the shame and sorrow of the past. They're underneath the precious blood of Christ, alas. Save, 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 I'm happy on the way. Save, 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 I love him more each day. Save, 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 I know he's mighty tower. He saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. Since the Savior found me, all to him I owe. For his precious blood has washed me white as snow. Now no condemnation, happy as can be. I'm glad that Jesus justifies and sets me free. Save, 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 I'm happy on the way. Save, 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 I love him more each day. Save, 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 I know he's mighty char. He saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. Since the Savior found me, I have perfect rest. Living in the realm of joy and happiness. Leaning on my Savior, looking for that day. When he shall come to catch his waiting bride away. Save, 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 I'm happy on the way. Save, 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 I love him more each day. Save, 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 I know he's mighty jar. He saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. Bless Amen. God. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's start the service with a word of prayer. Brother Max, would you do the honor of starting the service with a word of prayer? Sure. Thank you, God, for today, for this good Sunday. Thank you, God, for allowing us to worship you and only you. Thank you, God, for this church. Thank you, God, for the brethren in this church. Thank you, God, for the visitors in this church. I want to say thank you again for all that you've done for us, for our pastor, for all the brothers here, all the sisters over here, for me. And I thank you just allowing us to be here and yes, sir. all this wickedness and all this craziness and all this worldly stuff going on in the world. We're here today in this room for you and only for you. I want to thank you so much once again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. Take out your white hymnal. Take out your white hymnal. All right. Let's sing about that pearly white city. Amen. Oh, yes. All right, pearly white city. All right, open up your white hymnals to 54, please. 54. I don't know about you, but I want to go to that city right now. Amen. Right now. Amen. 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 Some of you don't pray hard enough about Jesus coming right now. You know, I think Jesus is taking his sweet time because we're not praying hard enough for that city. Tomorrow. All right. Pearly White City. Here we go. There's a holy and beautiful city whose builder and ruler is God. John saw it descending from heaven when Padma in exile he trod. Its high massive wall is of jasper, the city itself is pure gold. And when my frail tent here is folded, mine eye shall its glory behold. In that bright city, pearly white city, Why? 
tears ever moisten the eye. There's no disappointment in heaven. That's right, amen. No envy and strife in the sky. The saints are all sanctified holy. They live in sweet harmony there. My heart is now set on that city. And someday its blessings I'll share. Good morning. Nice to see all faces here, new or old. I don't care. You're all brethren in Christ. It's always a blessing to see you. So fri this Friday, this upcoming Friday, we're going to have discipleship at 7 p.m. and Bible study at 8 p.m. also at Pastor's Place. If you need the address, please ask him because I can't disclose that online, obviously. And here's another really important one. Possibly in the last week of June or the first week of July, Brother Turner and Pastor Ron Robinson, who pa who Pastor knows from PBI, his days in PBI, they may come to speak at our church. So keep those days open. You might see them. They're going to be awesome. We're going to have good preaching and teaching. And our missionary Hansen is going to be coming to our church on July 29th. So be ready for that as well We can su so that we can support him and see what his ministry is all about, what country he's going to, and what he's going to be doing for the Lord in whatever place he's going to. Um, Look forward to street preaching next Sunday, same corner, 10:30 a.m. at the Chevron gas station. Obviously, it's gonna be awesome. We might have, we have, we might get a couple more hail Satan's, amen. We might get some eggs, but it's gonna be all right. It's gonna be good. God's always with us. I, I'm telling you, that egg missed us by a couple inches. It was great, <laughs> but it's great. It's always fun. Our memory verses are going to be Psalms chapter 8, verses 1 to 2. If you can turn there real quickly, I will read them to you. This is our series in Psalms. We memorized chapter 1, chapter 12, chapter 23. Now we're on chapter 8. This is actually a very interesting chapter. Um, Psalm chapter 8, and we're going to be memorizing verses 1 to 2. If you take it one at a time, you'll be surprised. By the end of the year, you might just memorize five books of the whole books of the Bible. You never know. So we will memorize these. And the verse reads... O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Amen. Who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Amen. You can see the Lord is out to take care of us. Don't worry about getting revenge or anything. He is the one that will get, get that for us. No need to worry. And with that, I will pass back over to Pastor. Oh, 
all is still Heaven is silent As the mighty judge Ascends a throne The book of life is opened As countless souls begin to moan From the throne comes a voice like thunder Written in this book are the souls my blood has bought. Faces turn as into that courtroom comes a very seed of sin. He who was the saint's accuser must face the charges of his sin with the fury of all the ages that demon voice begins to cry it's not fair I almost had you on Golgotha, I watched you die, then Satan, he begins to tremble, as his fate to him was known, from the throne verdict the lake of fire will be your home then I see every knee is bowing every hand in honor is raised every voice That's my God, and we will bow to him, and we will worship him, because he is worthy. Amen. All right, if Brother Sean can come forward and take up the Lord's offering for us, and then ask God's blessing upon the church service with a word of prayer as well. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for bringing all of us here today. I think one thing that we all have in common in this room today, Father, is we're coming today to get something from you, Lord. We're coming right. to get something from heaven. We're not coming to hear pastor preach what Come on. he thinks, but Come we're on. coming to get the word of God. And Father, I pray that you would fill pastor with the Holy Spirit today as he sets out to give us what you gave to him. I pray, Father God, that you would soften each of our hearts in here today. Please uh, don't let any evil spirits, don't Amen. let anything that might Amen. come against this room and everyone Amen. in it trying to get the truth. 
uh, to hinder that, Father God. Yes, God. I pray that the seed that you have for us today would be planted into our hearts, into good soil, so that it would uh, grow and it would yield fruit for you, Lord Amen. God. I pray uh, what we're about to give, Father, I pray that it would not be of necessity, but uh, willingly and cheerfully. Amen. I pray that you would have it to be used to have uh, more souls get saved in these last days. And I pray that you would keep each and every one of us uh, going on, living for you, trying to get closer to you every single day, Lord Jesus, until you, you do come back. And I'm with Pastor. I don't think you can come back soon enough. Um, <laughs> as a great man once said, there's one thing that God definitely cannot do. He cannot do, and that's come too quickly for us. So please, all these things we pray in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, please come quickly, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hebrews chapter 3, please. Hebrews chapter 3. We'll look at Hebrews chapter 3, and we will read verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3, and we will read verse 13. It's very important that as we get closer and closer to the last days, and as wickedness rises even more, and as Christians' faith fail even more and more, it is more important than ever before to encourage one another and not to isolate one another, not to beat each other down, but to encourage one another. Some of you might say, Pastor, what happened to you today? Are you compromising today? What? You know, sometimes what you Christians need is that you need to learn to encourage one another and not slap each other on the face every stinking time. You need to realize that in this day and age, it's hard to serve God and that people's face are going, uh, faiths, are growing colder so they need your charity they need your love they need help Amen. they need help Amen. from you look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 the Bible says but exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin do you know why we preach hard against sin because a lot of people are falling into that but do you know why we should also encourage people and be positive? Because people are falling into that. you got to realize it's not always positive and it's not always negative. A battery runs because it has both positive and negative energy. And you got to realize that if you call yourself a Bible-believing Christian, you shouldn't have the audacity and the pride and the wickedness. It is wicked where you keep putting down other people because you give a pharisaical, snobbish attitude rather than realizing ha that there are people out there who are just, re realistically speaking, spiritually weaker than you. People out there who didn't have the luxury of the kind of background that you had. People who's going through something in their lives that you don't know about. And that's why it is absolutely important that you got to encourage one another. Don't, I mean, when you come to this church, don't you want somebody to come to you and say, I'm praying for you? Someone to say, hey, I love you, brother, and encourage you? Or would you like a person come to you and say, where were you at church last Sunday? <laughs> you know, you like that? You think you're going to come back to church again after that? Don't worry. The preaching will naturally come out that way, all right? You don't need to do it. God, the Holy Spirit, will naturally let that come out. What you need to do is you need to encourage the brother and sister. You know what people want today, though, when they come to church? They want to hoard in. They want to hoard in the blessing. They don't want to give out the blessing. You know what your job is when you come to church? Not for someone to pat your shoulder. Not for someone to encourage you. It's for you to encourage them. And that's what this sermon is going to be about, is that are you doing your job where you're encouraging people? See, you didn't come here to this preaching to hear self-encouragement. In this sermon, you're going to learn how to encourage other people because it's not all about you. Today, my title is Hoarder or Exhorter. Let's pray. God, my Father, I pray that you'll please wash away my sins with your holy blood. Fill within me the power of your spirit because this vessel is broken and useless and empty without Jesus Christ. 
And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will take full control out of today's preaching and that the love of God will be truly manifested out of this pulpit where it can reach and tug people's hearts and that you will get the glory. I pray that you'll give me the words I want to say because I can't say the words rightly. And you need to fill me and you need to take care of me, Lord. And I pray that people's hearts will be open and that you'll drive away any devil that will try to hinder the meeting. And that you'll make people's hearts and minds open to the word of God today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. My first point is the direction of exhortation. The direction of exhortation. We're going to keep turning to Hebrews 3.13 as our main text. So you probably want to bookmark that. But I want your other hand to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The direction of exhortation. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 5, in our main text, we're going to focus on that first part now in this first point. But exhort one another. See, that's where your exhortation should direct towards. Is It's not, it's, that's how it should be. Where's my exhortation? Why won't you encourage me? Oh, please pray for me. No, it's got to go like this. It's got to be, what can I pray for you? Can I encourage you in something? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Not, oh, woe is me. Oh, help me out here. No, let me help you. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about your problem. Woe is you. That's how it should be. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we will read verse 3. The Bible says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. You see that? It's not the fake positivity, the fake kind of smile and positive preach and positive encouragement where it's forcible and it's used in deceit to keep a person in church. Sometimes those people can be cult leaders, you got to understand. You got to realize some of the infamous cult leaders, why they were able to keep the people in church is because they use that deceit and guile where they pretend that they love them and then they pat their hand and make them feel welcomed and cozy inside a church. But, be, but behind the pulpit, they, they preach nonsense, they preach heresy, and they do something where they can get an agenda to grab somebody's wallet. So this kind of encouragement is not using deceit. It's not of uncleanness. Look at verse 5. For neither at any time used we flattering words. See that? It's not deliberately flattering people. Nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Look at verse 7. But we were, see this, gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. That's how the exhortation should be. See, exhortation is not flattery. It's not fake. It's gentleness that would uplift a brother to serve God. That's what it is. Not deliberate flattery, not uh, deliberate fake attitude to make people feel cozy and good. It's some. It's a gentle spirit where you try to uplift a brother to try to get into visitation, street preaching, Sunday services, to try to come to fellowship, to try to sing along and try to volunteer for prayer, volunteer for taking care of the service. That's what it is. Although exhortation can include rebuke at times, it does. It does. But most of the time, you got to realize it refers to encouragement. And you got to realize that the Apostle Paul, he worded it rightly right here that it's using what? As a nurse cherisheth her children, right? See, nurse, uh, if you're a proper caretaker of a little child, you don't leave them all spoiled, but you don't treat them harshly either. See, you use gentleness, and if a person misbehaves, you use firmness when necessary. You don't scream on top of your lungs and then, you know, abuse a child, right, or punch him or her in the face. Use that gentleness because it's a child we're talking about right here. And you got to realize this. Do you know what kind of a day and age we live in? Baby Christians. I'm sorry, that's reality. They're not Amen. soldiers in Jesus Christ Amen. like you. There are children, and you got to realize that babes in Christ, that you got to realize you got to use wisdom and the gentleness where you got to uplift them up 
to make them understand your conviction, to make them see the truth of the Bible. And then in time, they will become like a soldier at you, and they're not going to wow, wow, wow like little babies when a drill sergeant yells at his face at, to get in line as a soldier. But you're not doing that right now because you're dealing with babies. Until you can nurture and let that baby grow, then that person can take a lick in the preach and when the preacher points his finger at him and preaches hellfire and brimstone and that soldier can take it like a man and go, that's right, I need it. Amen. But see, you can't do that with everybody. You got to get them to grow and understand that, that we are in a warfare. This is not, this is not a, a playground. This is not the Garden of Eden. This is not uh, in a comfortable mattress with Jesus Christ where everything's humpty dory where you hold his hand and skip along around the garden that's not what it is this is war this is a battlefield there are so many enemies out there there's so much sin and wickedness out there Amen. so we need to have soldiers who would fight for the Lord Jesus Christ and can take a lick but in order for people to reach that level you gotta realize that they are babes first and then you gotta uplift them to become that eventually Because you got to think about this. Was God like that with you when you first got saved? Was God like that with you when uh, you first came to this church? And then some of you, some of you remember, some of you may have heard about this church, but how long did it take for you to finally get into church, right? Yeah, so, so you know what I'm talking about, right? See, I mean, what, did Pastor Kim, you know, hound you, get your number and say, hey man, it's been months, you know, why haven't you been coming to church? No, you got to realize this is that they are babes, you're at the new beginning stage, and you're learning and you're understanding, and people are like that. So you got to understand people are like that. People are like that. And aren't you glad that God didn't smack you around in the face as soon as you got saved and say, hey, wh why haven't you been serving? Why haven't you been street preaching yet? You know, some of you, how long did it take for you to finally preach on the street, right? Amen. Wasn't it like nurturing where you first part first came to Sunday services and then you came to more services and then you came to street preaching and, and then it was holding a sign and then after that then you finally couldn't take it anymore and then you started to preach the wages of sin is death right amen that's right see it took nourishment it took time the only person who had the guts to do it the first time was brother max and his first church service was not in this was not sunday it was preaching on the street you know i'm sorry no one's a soldier like max okay you got to realize that everyone it's the first time they're babes. They're babes, and you got to get them to, you got to be gentle and encourage them to get into the fight. Be gentle, encourage them to serve God. Because you, aren't you glad God wasn't like that with you? Some of us might say, well, they're supposed to serve God, so why should I encourage them to serve God? Why should I be loving, gentle, nice, and then try to... Uh, motivate them to come into church service. I don't believe in that, motivating people to serve God. Well, uh, you know, aren't you motivated to serve God when God's giving you gold, silver, precious stones, and a lot of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ? And don't you want God to compliment you? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. What, doesn't that rile you up? Doesn't that motivate you? Wouldn't it be lame that you just go to the judgment seat of Christ and then God says, no, I ain't going to give you rewards. You're supposed to serve me. That's what you're supposed to do. And God has the right to do that. Amen? Amen. God has the right not to give you cities to rule, crowns to have, gold, silver, precious stones, an inheritance of all things, and that's more than the world. You got to realize God does not have to do that. God, what he deserves is that he should judge you on whatever failure that you have done, straighten you out, and then whatever good thing you've done, then God says, you're supposed to do that for me anyway. You, your heart would sink, right, at the judgment seat of Christ if God, if God did that with you? So then why can't you understand that you shouldn't be like that with other people as well? You got to realize, oh, you're supposed to serve God, so why should I motivate you? Why should I encourage you? Why should I, you know, look, man, God don't have to do that either. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11, it says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. See, you got to realize this, is that you don't need to be the chastiser of the brethren and get them to serve God. Trust me, they got enough. 
If you're backsliding, you're not right with God. All right, God is more than enough to what? Chasing you. Trust me, man. They they uh, they know. They got it already. They have all, the brethren have been put down enough by God. You know why? They their conscience is giving them a guilt trip. They feel uneasy about the sins they're committing because of the preaching they heard on Sundays. And if you've been in our preachings on Sundays, you do know this. You don't get away with it. Amen. All right? Trust me. They got beaten down enough by the preaching. Trust me. They got chastised enough by the Lord. They're going through some kind of trial or suffering. But in reality, it's probably a chastening. Yep. Trust me. Uh, they know. They know. If you have the Holy Spirit in you and you're doing something dumb and stupid, trust me, you will get the memo that you're doing something wrong. And if you're too blind to see it, God's going to make it come down even harder for you to finally see it. And you don't need a PhD. You don't even need to graduate from high school to see that. Anyone can see that there's that the Lord's trying to deal with me on something. So when they finally come to church after being beaten down by God, Aren't you glad that Pastor Kim runs to you and beats you down too? Do you get glad and happy? Or do you get like, wow, Pastor, I've already been beaten down by God enough. See, you don't need that. Look, God thoroughly takes care of his children. And you got to realize this. The brother may be backslidden. He probably doesn't deserve encouragement. But you got to realize this, is that they've already been pushed down enough by God to serve him you don't need to push them down even more where they're too discouraged and sad that they don't come to church anymore you got to realize that God is more than enough to take care of them I mean you saw the evidence in our church right whenever we had people uh, I mean we had people publicly attacking us people deliberately trolling into the church and didn't the Lord thoroughly take care of those kind of people we, he did, didn't he? So trust me, the Lord will thoroughly take care of them. You don't need to do the work yourself. Don't push people down to serve God. You know what you need to do? You need to pull them up. That's what you need to do. You, they've already been pushed down, pushed down, pushed down so much. They need somebody to pull them up now. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. You see that? It's a, like a relationship of a parent with a child. That ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. You got to understand this. You know what Paul says right here? Paul says, it's my job to exhort you, to encourage you, to be gentle with you. And I made sure I did my job right, Paul said, because I don't want to be chargeable to you. And you're my witnesses on that. So you got to realize this. Okay, maybe the brother and sister in Christ may be worse than you spiritually. Maybe the brother and sister in Christ may be totally messed up and wrong. But guess what? Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be so incredibly frustrating and heart-wrenching that the person that you judged severely, that uh, instead of encouraging, that that person becomes a witness against you at the judgment seat of Christ because you're held chargeable to exhort them. But because you fail to exhort them, you get some backslider, some person who's less spiritual than you, becoming a witness against you at the judgment seat of Christ. How would that feel? Ouch, right? The person that you judge turns out to be the person who judged against you, even though if you're more in the right. You know why? Because you're held chargeable and accountable to encourage them. And if you failed in that job, God's going to use that person as a witness. Okay, did that person encourage you? What do you think that person's going to say? How are you going to feel at the judgment seat of Christ? Oh, Pastor Kim's very nice, too nice. You know why? It's because I got to do my job. That's why. It's not because I'm a nice guy. It's because I got to do my job. That's why. <laughs> Otherwise, you will be my witness at the judgment seat of Christ. See, you got to realize this is that imagine the embarrassment and the shame 
that you thought in your self-righteous zeal that you're trying to get them right with God but in, actual, in actuality that was a judgmental call and then God judged you for that because your job was to motivate and to encourage the brethren and then God said did he do his job properly and what if that person says no they're witnesses that's why you got do you now realize why you, your job is to encourage them now if you don't encourage them Trust me, they're not going to encourage you at the judgment seat of Christ. Wouldn't you like for them to encourage you at the judgment seat of Christ? Hey, he's a witness. Did he encourage you? Man, Lord, I mean, he should deserve that crown because that person been praying for me and I didn't pray for him. Wouldn't that be a blessing? That a person actually encouraged you and said to the Lord, and was your witness supporting you at the judgment seat of Christ? My second point is the days of exhortation. The days of exhortation. Uh, in our main text in Hebrews 3.13, the next part of that verse, it says, daily which it is called today. That can preach right there. You know how often you should exhort? Daily. And if you don't get the memo, today. <laughs> That's what you should be doing. If some of you don't encourage each other after this preaching is over, you're not doing your job. Watch, every, after church service is over, everyone's going to go, Hi! Hi! Pleasure to meet you! Hi! Pleasure to meet you! Yeah, love you in the Lord! You know, Watch what happens. See, you got to realize that you got to exhort each other daily. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. See, you got to realize this. Isn't it hard to stand for every right doctrine? To stand for what is right? to avoid sin and everything that is wrong. Isn't that hard enough? Not only that, you got the devil on your back persecuting you with family hardship, financial hardship, and then uh, all kinds of conflicts in your life. The stress and the pressure is so severe. And then when that person comes to church, does that person need 10 people to pounce on that person and then get them to run away from the only spiritual revival that the person can get after being beaten down 24-7 by the world, the flesh, and the devil? You got to realize this. You all know what I'm talking about because I know a lot of you are going through personal problems and sufferings in your life. You know what I'm talking about. When you, the reason why you come to church is because you feel that spiritual upliftment that you need. You know that the brothers are there for you. The sisters in Christ are there for you. You got a family who backs you up. Not ten people waiting to pounce on you saying, Where was the, when's the last time you came to the service? Not some brother and sister pointing out your defect. You like, you come because that's your spiritual nourishment. But if you had a bunch of these people, you know, saying bad stuff about you, and then pointing out your deficiency, and then having the preacher just preach a sermon that just keeps deliberately pointing out that specific person in the church. Why? Because the pastor is all flesh and just wants to point out that specific person's problem. You think the person is going to come back to church after that? You got to realize this. That is not the attitude you should have after being beaten down 24-7 by the wickedness of the world, the flesh, and the devil. You got to realize this. They are so discouraged and they need encouragement. Especially a lot of encouragement. After six days being beaten down by the world, the flesh, and the devil, they need the encouragement at least once. At least once that week to get them back in the fight to serve God because you got to realize brethren are weary in well-doing you got to realize so if a person is going through a suffering or a problem you know what the pastor should do and you know it shouldn't go oh yeah here we go again yeah another person's problem oh boy no, no that's not how it should be it should be wow I'm sorry I feel for you you got to understand that person you got to say I'm praying for you that's how it should be. Not like, oh, you got to be a soldier. Come on, you know, this is like the hundredth time. No, it shouldn't be like that. Now, of course, there's a certain limit, okay? I don't want people sobbing about their problems here. All right, it's just going to give me a headache, you know? I don't want that, all right? This, this is not a church where you, I mean, we're supposed to be encouraging, not discouraging, right? So if you keep pouring out a sob story, that's not encouraging. That's discouraging everybody. 
But if a person is going through some suffering and affliction, my goodness, it's not like, hey, you should man up. Oh, come on. No, it's, you got, your job is to encourage them. Come on. Encourage them. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, it says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. See, in that verse it says that if you want to have friends, you've got to be friendly. See that? Are you truly that person's friend in the church? Can you honestly say I'm your friend to that particular person in the church or to anybody? Not just anybody. It should be everybody in the church if they're a saved brother and sister in Christ, That's right? right? They're your friends, right? If they are, then that verse just must show himself friendly. Amen. You can't just say, oh, he's my brother, he's my sister, he or she is my friend, and then you just don't talk to them at all. You got to realize this. If that person is your friend, your brother and sister in Christ, you got to take some effort where you get out of your seat and talk to the brother and sister, not waiting for someone to talk to you. And that is something important you got to realize. You know what happens to people in church? People come to church so that they can feel the encouragement rather than encouraging somebody else out there. You know what the pastor's got to do? No matter what kind of... Uh, issues or problems he's going through in his life he's not going to parade about it to the people in the church but rather think about the person's suffering the other person's problem and encourage the other person that's why a lot of pastors are private about their lives you know why because it is a shameful thing for men of God to do that it's more about the sheep the sheep and the sheep and you got to realize that you're not you got to realize that you got to grow up and you got to stop being selfish and you got to think about other people out there. Talk to them. Not only that, you got to pray for them. Stop asking. Stop, stop saying, oh, I need prayer, I need prayer, I need prayer. You got to pray for them now. You got to say, let me pray for you. Pray for them. Not only that, make them see your love. Oh, I love them. If, they, if you do love them, then what's in the heart should come out outwardly. Do they know you love them? Can they really sense and say that you really do love them? You gotta outwardly show it. Outwardly show it. You know Big Chuck loves you in our church, right? Yeah. That member in our church? You know he loves you. You know why? Always says that. You know, first time he meets Stan, just first time, and then as soon as he lives, leaves, I love you, Stan, you know, like that. And Stan's like, Yeah, I love you too, like that. See, the thing is, is that you gotta realize this is that. Let them, you know the person will love you because it shows. Not only that, I mean, show acts of kindness. You know, be kind. Show that you really care for them. You know a person struggling with something, just give them money secretly. I, I know you're suffering something. You know, this pastor, it's amazing that this pastor survived because there are some people who just, who doesn't know about my suffering or my problem and they'll just give me money and say, I, I know you need this. You know how much of a joy that is to a pastor? You know, they put the, usually you see this at church, they'll put the money in the hand and then shake the preacher's hand. You know, that's how they do it. You know, preacher's all discouraged, shakes a member's hand. Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, uh-huh. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You know, like that. But you got to realize this. You got to show acts of kindness. Not only that, this is so important. If you're really their friend, you would sacrifice for them. That's what it is. Sacrificing. Talking to them when they don't talk to you. Giving money to them when they don't give money to you. Showing that you love them when they don't show love to you. And one of the hardest things to do as a Christian is that you love the person when the person doesn't love you back. Right. And I, the reason why I'm stressing that is I know what I'm talking about as a pastor of a church. You suffer a lot of unfairness. And if you haven't seen anything yet, you just stick around in church. Trust me, in church, they might be blood-washed, blood-bought, and Bible-believing. But trust me, brethren are, sometimes can fail you, let you down, and be very unfair and mean and cruel to you. You'd be surprised. Stick around and find out. And you know what you are? If you are that brother and sister in Christ, you show them love when they don't show love to you. Sometimes it can be very hard to a person when we're like thinking, why encourage them 
went so tiring and futile with not one result. They'll never change for God. Do you know how easy it is to think like that? When, especially let's say you're in a small church and you show love to the person and then you're just so tempted, you're just so tempted to preach something harder. You're just so tempted to give in like some kind of little nudge right there where, hey, you know, can you help us out or something like that? I, trust me, it is so tempting to do that. And it feels like a waste of time when you're spending love on them and that person doesn't spend love on you in return. And they don't come to church. They don't help you out. And it seems so wasteful and tiring. But there was once a minister who dreamed that he tried to grow a vegetable garden. And after constantly doing it for days without result, the minister, he said, it's useless. I'm going to stop. But suddenly a man stood by him and asked, were you not allotted this task? And if so, why are you going to abandon it? The minister, he replied back, It's tiring and wasteful with not one single result. The man told them basically this, and you need to get this in your heads. That is nothing to you. Your duty is to grow them, whether the plant yields or no. The work is yours. The results are in the other hands. Work on. The minister continued and the garden flourished in his church. Now, you know what the point is? The point is, is that it's not by your efforts where you get the person to return the love, to encourage you, to support you, to come to church. No, it's God that brings in the fruit. It's God that works in that individual's heart through your outward testimony, through your love, through your encouragement, to finally melt that person's heart with conviction. It's God that drives that person to church, drive that person to support you, drive that person to help you, drive that person to love you in return. It's the Lord that brings the result and the fruit, not you. So when you show love to people and they treat you unfairly, when you try to encourage the brethren and they discourage you in return, it's not your job to get the fruit. It's God's job to bring in the fruit. And you know what? I'm going to tell you as a pastor for many years, the Lord never fails to prove that. The Lord never fails to prove that. It is easy to see that it's a failure, it's a waste of time, but the Lord wants to see your heart if you're doing it for fruit or you're doing it because you're supposed to do it. God says your duty is not to bring in the fruit. Let me worry about it, says God. Let me worry about it, says the great I am that I am. Let me worry about it, says God, who can do all things through Christ. Let God do it. Nothing is impossible for our Lord God. Let me handle it, says He. That's him, not you. You know what your job is? Your job is to love the person, encourage the person, support the person, and that person doesn't return any love. If you don't get any fruit, you don't get soul saved, you don't get one member in your church, you don't get any blessing out of that, you've accomplished your duty. Good job. It's not a defeat when you encourage somebody and you don't get fruit. That's God's business. That's God's problem for, to worry about, not you. You know what your job is? Just to encourage them. Not getting fruit. Is your job to get the fruit? Or is your job to plant the seed? Or is your job to toil the ground? Or is your job to water the plant? You think that you can change them after your outward testimony to finally get your lost loved one to finally get some brother and sister in church to change? No, it's not your job. That's God's job to change them. Your job is to exhort them. That's your job. God, it's God's power to change the person's life, not yours. That's why, you know, um, it's so easy for the pastor. I mean, I want to encourage other Bible-believing pastors and those of you who are going to run, uh, take care of a classroom or are responsible for members, you got to realize this. Stop getting a guilt trip where, you know, I should have worded it better. You know what, if I'd been a little nicer. Oh, you know what, I shouldn't have preached or taught that way. Oh, if it was a different subject. What did I do? What's wrong? Every single pastor thinks like that when they go through a small church for years. It's so easy to say, what am I doing wrong? Everyone thinks like that. 
You got to stop thinking like that and realize, look, it's God's business. You're not doing anything wrong. You're just doing your job. Your job wasn't to get the fruit. You think that you've done something wrong when there's nobody in church, when there's no one who gets saved, when you get small re results, you think you did something wrong? No. God did something wrong then. God did something wrong by not bringing the fruit. That is God's wrongdoing. If he's not wrong, then he has a reason for it, doesn't he? Amen. He has a timetable and a plan for it, doesn't he? See? So that means there's nothing wrong, okay? You're doing what's right, all right? Your job is not to get the blessings and the fruit built up. Your job was to, have you encouraged them? Yes. Have you said you pray for them? Yes. Have you preached what God wanted you to preach and in a way where it was not directly, specifically aimed, but it was actually for love of the brethren? Yes. Then, do, you're doing a good job. Don't worry about it. Don't get discouraged. Don't get a guilt trip. Don't get tired and quit encouraging. You got, you're doing a good job, so stop, so don't stop halfway now. My third point is the deficiency of exhortation. The deficiency of exhortation. Please return to our main text again. Please return to our main text again. At Hebrews 3.13, the last part. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, this is something really important that I want you to understand here. This, this is the most important reason why you should encourage them. You know why? The deficiency of such exhortation will get a person's heart hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I don't know if you truly understood that. Let me give you an example right here. You got to realize that this world is so deceitful. There are so many lost, wicked people out there who says, I'm your friend, I love you. Hey, let's have a good time. What can I do to help you? There are plenty of rich opportunities that the world has can offer for a saved Christian to backslide and to not be faithful to church. There are so many things that the God of this world, Satan himself, says, all this kingdom that I can deliver to you if you will just bow down and worship me. There are so many things in this world that can deceive a person's heart where he can find his or her encouragement. Because if you won't encourage the person, the person will go to the fridge and turn to the bottle to encourage him. If you won't be the person that will encourage him, that person will turn to his cigarette and then take a smoke to find his or her encouragement. If the brethren in this church can't show love and encourage the person, that person will go to a different church or to the lost world to seek the love and the encouragement. That's why you got to realize it's so important to encourage. You know why? They're going to seek encouragement someplace else. You know why? Because that's human nature. Human nature can't survive loneliness, suffering, isolation, depression, and misery. Human nature wants encouragement from somebody. And if the person can find it in this church who stands for Bible-believing truth, who's supposed to shed the love of Jesus Christ more than any other person, then that is a shameful thing that the person will leave this place and to seek someplace else to find the love, to find the encouragement, to find the happiness. Man, what a shameful and a wicked, it is a wicked thing that a person can't seek love and the encouragement in this kind of a church that's supposed to stand for truth and what is right and they go to what is wrong to find happiness and joy and encouragement. You know why sin is so deceitful? It, de it deceives them. It makes them think, we give you the joy. We give you the love. Satan deceives people. I'll be good to you if God's people won't. Hebrews 10.25, some of you know that verse. It's so important and it's so amazing how many people ignore that. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another but did it say exhorting one another or did it say and so much the more see so much the more see you got to exhort even more than ever before why as ye see the day approaching we live in a day and age that's like one of the worst day and ages where a person can fall into sin the world and the flesh and the devil so easily so because we are getting worse and worse in that kind of a day and age that's when you got to show love even more now, even more. 
I don't know if you ever notice this, but sometimes what I do is that you notice sometimes I would concentrate on the newcomers or other people who are not good at talking. You know why? Because I got to realize this, I can't ignore the person who needs encouragement and love. You got to realize this, it's not just picking and choosing what friends you want to talk to. It's everyone that you've got to realize, I, you know, that I don't want to lose that person. I don't want to lose that person. I don't want to lose that person. It's not my own selective little group. It's every brother and sister in Christ in the room. See, you know, it's so easy to get caught up in fellowship and focusing on your encouragement. And it's so easy to ignore another person's encouragement, right? Another person who needs to be talked to. Another person who needs to be loved. Wouldn't it be horrible that at the judgment seat of Christ, you're the one responsible for having some brother and sister not being able to attend San Jose Bible Baptist Church? Wouldn't that be an awful thing? Wouldn't that be a sad thing? Because you fail to show love and encouragement to that brother and sister in Christ. That's why, you know, what this pastor does is... He tries to focus on everyone. I can't let one person go because I got to show them love. I don't want to look. You got to realize, look at that person and, and ask yourself this. Do I want to lose that person? Do I want that person to mess up his or her life in sin? And then maybe you'll stop thinking about yourself and seeking your own attention, your own encouragement. You know, mostly the book of Isaiah, you'll find out, is about God's judgment. And yet there is one of those few exceptions. And you see one of those few exceptions in Isaiah 40. And we're not going to turn there, but you can turn there if you want. You know what's so comforting? When you start, you just start out Isaiah 40. It starts out, comforty, comforty my people, saith your God. You got to think about this. Do you know how powerful those four words were? Comfort ye my people. Isaiah, he preached hard against sin and slammed them about God's judgment. But I want to thank God Isaiah mentioned those four words. Comfort ye my people. I want to thank God that Isaiah started to do some encouragement, motivation. You know why? Just a few words of encouragement. You know how it did? It transformed history. If Isaiah never said those words... Handel would not have wrote his Messiah that began with comforty. If Isaiah didn't preach that, he wouldn't have Luther to complete his German Bible when he encouraged himself by reading comforty. If Isaiah didn't preach that, he wouldn't have produced an Oliver Cromwell to lead a successful English reign amidst a chaotic time because that ruler kept looking at the words comforty. If Isaiah never said those words, he wouldn't have produced a classical writer named Tennyson. To complement that verse, Tennyson actually said this. One of the five greatest classics in the Old Testament is that one, Comfort. See, what can prevent many people to end their lives in tragedy and even transform their life forever? It can transform their history, their life forever, where they can be a soul winner. A famous preacher, maybe. A great Christian one day. A one who will win hundreds of souls salvation. You'll never know what that person will become when you just go to them and comfort ye, my people. I love you, brother. I love you, sister. I'm praying for you. Hope to see you next Sunday. I'm sorry to hear what happened. We're here for you. You never know. Those words can change somebody's life forever. Amen. And it'll, just those words will get the person to come back again. Just those words will give them the energy to keep fighting against the trials that the person is going through. Just those words would make the person realize that, you know, God is real. Just those few words would maybe get the person to get the upliftment to say, okay, God, I'll, I'll keep fighting a little longer. I'll keep hanging in there. Just those few words. Because I'll tell you one thing, it changed my life forever when there were just a few words. So the few words of some brother and sister in Christ, I can't thank God enough 
because you got to realize this no preacher parades about their problems and no person who comes in parades about their problem do you get people coming in and parading oh this is a bad thing that bad thing like that you don't get people doing that because love is private love is personal but you never knew you never know how many times you save that person and you save this pastor's life from continuing God's ministry just because of a few words uh, pastor that was a great sermon pastor that changed my life pastor we thank God for you what would, what would I do without you pastor some people online saying this message changed my life I pray to God you won't quit you don't think that changes my life forever you don't think that would make me continue the ministry more years you don't think that that would make me never quit on God you don't think that would make that would not make me preach even more powerfully and to teach more mightily and you don't think that would do to anybody else here it would change a person's life forever if you would just realize they just needed a few encouraging words what made me the man I am today is because there were people here and there that I thank God for and I will never trade the world for I want to thank God for people the Lord sent in my life to encourage me seems we're a million miles apart yet you still reach me when the phone rings I know it's you then I hear you say that you've been praying and you thought that I could use a word to help get me through you don't have to know you don't have to see you don't have to shed one more tear you just love me and you pray for me that's a friend oh the joy that fills my heart when I'm around you I can hardly wait for eternity but until then I'll be thankful just to know you I'm reminded of his love when you speak to me you don't have to know you don't have to see you don't have to shed one more tear you just love me and you pray for me that's a friend oh the ties that binds us are stronger than this world the love we share is greater still God puts special people in our lives for a reason and you've been there for me oh you've been there for me you don't have to know you don't have to see you don't have to shed one more tear you just love me and you pray for me that's a friend that's a brother that's a sister like no other you just love me and you pray for me that's a friend Amen. every head bow and every eye shut the altar call is open if the lord led upon your heart please feel free come down forward here on the altar's floor and to pray to the lord there are some brothers and sisters you need to encourage now you got to realize it's not about yourself it's about others and you got to realize this that's why I kept pastoring that's why I didn't quit is because of people who encouraged this pastor and returned and loved him and it's just you didn't have to know about my problems you didn't even have to see everything I'm going through it's just you just loved me and you prayed for me and that's what made the difference in my life 
and it'll change another person's life too if you would do so. so some of you if this is your first time hearing this kind of preaching and you know you want to experience that love of Jesus Christ you can experience that today you know there's an important question you have to ask yourself if you were to die today if you were to die today are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven are you 100% sure you might say man pastor I, I really don't know well you know what I love you in the Lord and that's why I'm here to encourage you I want you to get saved you might say man pastor well help me out I mean how do I get saved it's so easy to get saved just three things three things to get you gotta understand number one realize you sinned all right and because God is holy he can't even allow one sin into heaven so you first gotta understand you can't go to heaven you first gotta realize that because you've sinned you're gonna burn in hell for all eternity you gotta understand that lost condition first that I'm lost without God that's why I need to get saved and you might say well preacher that's like a duh question of course I know I'm a sinner and of course I don't think I can go to heaven so I need to get saved okay good that's what you need then the second thing is this the second thing if you realize that your sin will put you to hell and not to heaven then the second thing is this Jesus is God and he came down here on earth and died for you on the cross and raised himself from the dead now you've heard that story a million times okay I know Jesus died buried resurrected Jesus died buried resurrected why is that important oh it's important because that's how you go to heaven okay this is the part you want to pay attention to you ready you go to hell because of sin right the only thing to wash away your sin is the blood of Jesus that's why Jesus died buried and resurrected you see that so his blood can come out and wash away every sin you've done so because only Jesus blood can wash away your sin all you have to do to get saved we're at number three already in number three all you have to do to get saved is just say to God say to God okay God I believe that blood of Jesus to save me so I'm only trusting in the blood that's it you just simply believe Jesus died buried and resurrected is the only thing to save you that's it all you have to do is say that to God you might say what well, don't I have to go to church to get saved don't I have to clean up my sins don't I have to do a lot of good things and be a good person no my friend baptism and doing good works cannot save you otherwise why did Jesus even die for you then Jesus died so that his blood can save you you can't do anything for yourself so all you can do is just rely on the blood to save you you might say well pastor I want to do that right now I want to rely on that blood to save me okay great I'll give you the words on how to say it to the Lord and all you have to do is just say to God, say to God, I'm relying on the blood to save me. You might say, well, you know, pastor, I haven't prayed much before. I don't know how to say the right words. Can you help me out? Sure, I'll give you the words on how to say it. I'll give you the words on how to say it, and all you have to do is repeat after me. Now, don't worry. Every head is bowed. Every eye is shut. No one is looking around. I'm not going to point out who you are. Okay, this is between you and God. Don't worry. It's, you're not going to embarrass yourself. If you're embarrassed to say it out loud, you can just say it inside, okay? You can even just say it inside when I give you the words to repeat after me, okay? So don't worry, this is completely private. All right, you want to get saved? You want to say to God that you're trusting in the blood to save you? Okay, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you the words that you can say it. You can repeat after me. And don't worry, you can say it inside, okay? Dear God, I repent as a sinner and I believe Jesus is God who died buried and resurrected so his blood can save me I'm trusting 
in the blood, not on my good works, to save me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would just bow your heads one more minute, one more minute, and we'll be done. We'll be done just one more minute. If you would just keep your heads bowed and eyes shut, no one looking around. All right. If you just repeated those words after me, could you slip up your hand real briefly? I'm not going to point you out. No one knows who you are. Every head is bowed and every eye is shut. You might say, Pastor, I've just told God I'm trusting in the blood to save me. I repeated those words after you. Could you just slip up your hand real briefly and real quickly? And we're not going to point you out. Okay, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. All right, so let's close with a word of prayer. Let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father God, for salvation in the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's only by trusting in that blood we can be saved. I pray, Heavenly Father, today's preaching has touched our hearts. Lord, sometimes we Bible believers can get too self-righteous and think we're overtly spiritual than other people when we've got to learn to love one another and we've forgotten the basics where you said the second commandment you said the second commandment god was to love thy neighbor as thyself lord help us to have charity put on charity which is the bond of peace as the verse says help us to stop looking at ourselves and looking at others and start to encourage each other in jesus name we pray amen out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.